Equal access to justice is a core American value. In each episode of Talk Justice, an LSC podcast, we will explore ways to expand access to justice and illustrate why it is important to the legal community, businesses, government, and the general public. Talk Justice is sponsored by the Leaders Council of the Legal Services Corporation. And so we have what was already a crisis to begin with, compounded by a never um, a type of public health and economic crisis that we haven't seen in at least 100 years and, and arguably never. Um, and one of the ways we can try to institute and protect some someone's of fairness through this is to make sure that in our, our justice system, which is supposed to ensure that it's you're supposed to be your backstop, the place where when all else fails, you get a fair shake. We can at least make sure that that has the tools needed and necessary and the resources needed and necessary to try to catch our citizens so that they do get a fair shake in what we know is going to be a crisis coming forward. And as of now, they don't. Hello and welcome to Talk Justice, an LSC podcast. I'm your host, Ron Flagg, president of the Legal Services Corporation. Today we'll be talking with representatives Susan Brooks of Indiana and Joe Kennedy of Massachusetts about the vital role that civil legal aid plays in ensuring access to justice for low-income Americans and why it should be funded by the federal government. We'll also explore how the COVID pandemic is creating an even greater need for civil legal aid and how such assistance can address other problems such as racial injustice and opioid use disorder. Representatives Brooks and Kennedy founded the Bipartisan Congressional Access to Civil Legal Services Caucus in 2015 and have been strong supporters of LSC for many years. Representative Brooks has represented the 5th District of Indiana since 2012. As a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and former chair of the House Ethics Committee, she has advocated for mental health, biodefense, and public safety, among other issues. Before her election to Congress, Representative Brooks served as the U.S. Attorney for Indiana's Southern District and spent over a decade in private law practice. Representative Kennedy has represented the 4th District of Massachusetts since 2013. As a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, he has advocated for mental health and addiction issues, lowering energy costs, fortifying community health centers, and increasing STEM education. Previously, he served as an assistant DA in both the Middlesex County and Cape and Islands District Attorney's offices in Massachusetts. I wanna thank you both for being with us, but today's not the only day. More importantly, thank you for your leadership in advancing access to civil justice in America. And that is a perfect segue to my first question. Our country faces a lot of critical issues. What prompted each of you to focus on civil legal aid and civil legal justice? Representative Brooks? Well, thanks, Ron, uh, for having us in this conversation. And uh, thank you for your leadership. Um, It's really important uh, that lawyers like yourself throughout the country Um, step up and do their part um, to help our fellow citizens. I have to tell you, it was actually an orientation. Uh, Joe and I came into Congress at the same time. Um, We actually started Congress together in 2013. And Harvard has a seminar uh, for members right after they've won their elections to come and get ready to enter into Congress. And it was the classic kind of punch bowl that Joe and I, or maybe it was a shrimp bowl, I don't recall, but we were, uh, we, we met at that uh, conference um, and began talking a little bit about our backgrounds. Uh, we were a couple of the lawyers in the room. And uh, I want to give credit to Joe because we started talking about those things that we had in common, things that we had worked on together. I had been at my state's community college system after being U.S. attorney. He liked that. We started talking about his background as a lawyer. And um, after we got to Congress, uh, both saw the need, 
but I want, do want to give Joe credit. It was his and his staff's idea to start this caucus. And I was really pleased when he came to me and asked me to be the Republican lead, because that's the best way for caucuses to operate in the House, is to have a Democrat and a Republican lead. And so I was really proud to be his partner. But uh, so that's kind of how it got started. Susan, um, Representative Brooks is characteristically uh, humble in this. Uh, look, when I, um, I was a prosecutor before coming into uh, office and you saw that um, whether it was in a criminal court or uh, I'd done a lot of legal aid work when I was in law school uh, in the Boston housing courts and you saw the dramatic difference that it makes to have a lawyer by your side versus when you don't. Um, and that was well, one of my motivating factors to, to run for office and trying to equalize those scales of justice. And um, as I, I knew it was something that I wanted to work on here, and candidly, I knew the legislative side of it was going to be difficult. Um, and I came in hoping that there was going to be some ways, uh, largely through elevating the issue and then uh, through the appropriations process, that we might be able to, to gain some attention. And as I was getting to know some of our new colleagues, um, Mrs. Brooks, uh, Susan's uh, background and her uh, understanding of these issues just obviously stood out amongst everyone. And Candidly, the fact that when I asked, she said yes, was spectacular. Um, and it has been so incredibly important, Ron, I think, for the support that we've been able to, to um, raise for and the, the awareness around this issue to have this be bipartisan. Um, I think for, for a really long time, this has been looked at, the issue on legal aid and legal services has been looked at as uh, an anti-property program that has been kind of a, a, a focus of uh, kind of the, the progressive left or Democrats, and it, that it clearly is part of that. But there's there's other pieces to this that, um, in the framing of that issue, ends up being really important. I think for um, conservatives and for Republicans, which is why we've seen um, the caucus through the legitimacy that Susan brings to it and the relationships that she brings to it, not just saying, "Hey, this is," and, and I give her an awful lot of credit for this, not just saying, "Hey, you know," as a Republican finding a, uh, an issue that I can work with Democrats on for political purposes and just check that box and say, oh yeah, by the way, when I'm in the midst of a, a, a campaign, I can say I worked with a, a Democrat on something, but for her to really allocate time and effort and energy and political capital to it and to bring the number of Republicans into this caucus that we founded to a high, to increase support, conservative support for the LSE to an all time high. And to celebrate some of those conservative voices in the room, like Chief Justice Hecht of, of Texas, who um, I think it's fair to say that he and I don't necessarily agree on a whole lot of things politically, but we found the one. And um, the fact that we're willing to and able to work together on this and celebrate it, I think is critically important. And Susan deserves an awful lot of credit for being willing to, to be first in that and to um, then uh, you want to spend that capital to, to bring others in um, and to educate them about it. Because um, it's candidly something that we would not, I would not have been able to do uh, without the legitimacy and integrity that she brings. To well, you've, you've, you've succeeded magnificently. I mean, we, in, in recent years, we've had supporters, uh, Democrats, Republicans, we've had members of the Freedom Caucus, we've had members of the Progressive Caucus. There, I can't think of a lot of issues these days that uh, unite people uh, in that way. And it wouldn't have happened without the two of you uh, uh, showing the leadership you've done. But I, I'd actually like to explore a bit more sort of the origins of, of your, your passion for the issue. Uh, you mentioned law school and, and legal aid in law school. And I'm hoping that some of our listeners out there may be uh, law students or, you know, uh, potential law students. How, how, you know, what experience is, did you have that uh, affected you uh, in the ways you've described? Look, I, um, Ron, I came out of, I went into law school after um, a couple years in the Peace Corps. And it was my time in the Peace Corps that solidified the fact for me, my experience there, uh, that I wanted to go to law school because you saw how I saw how powerful the law was at um, addressing some inequities and how it can also be used to reinforce them. And I wanted to learn more about that. Um, and I 
so I went out to law school excited about that prospect. And uh, for those of you that can remember that first year of law school, it, it's a um, it's an intense experience, but it just doesn't necessarily dive into that, right? It dives into you know the, the basics of literally teaching you and immersing you in a different way of thinking in a different language, um, and the basic aspects of law. Um, and so I was looking for something out of this like extremely visceral and tangible experience from being a Peace Corps volunteer in the rural Dominican Republic, where your horizons are. Uh, basically defined by 100 yards in any direction where people struggle to get access to, to electricity and, and food, um, to these discussions around law school that were uh, extraordinarily intellectual and academic discussions, but missed kind of the, the, the human consequence sometimes of what was at stake and the humanity behind that law school case that you were reading. And so I ser was searching for a bit of that. Um, throughout my law school experience and came across a legal aid clinic, um, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. And they um, took students and threw you into um, Boston Housing Court amongst a couple other experiences, which is like the most, it is the most, um, part of the, the most gritty and um, just human aspects of our system and the way it works and oftentimes the way it doesn't. And every Thursday in, in Boston Housing Court is eviction day. And it is a, uh, it is a gut-wrenching thing to observe and to watch happen every single day uh, or every single week. Um, and that to me, just, you don't have to spend much time there to see the difference of what happens when you have an institutional player, a commercial landlord that has a lawyer doing evictions every single day or every single week and spending their life working on these cases versus people that don't and that are afraid. And look, sometimes they might, they might've done something that merits eviction. Sometimes there's legal defenses there. Um, sometimes their rights are actually being ignored and not addressed. And unless you have a lawyer that knows how to navigate that system, they're not going to be heard. And so it was a big wake up call to me to say, Hey, my rights and your rights are both codified in law. But if you don't have access to them and you don't know how to access to them, they might as well not be. And to see the impact of just having a, an advocate there by your side who knew how to navigate that system versus not and going it alone and the enormous uh, disparate impact that that has. Um, that's what kind of uh, drove me to try to say, hey, there is a massive um, inequity that is taking place that most of the country doesn't know about and says, hey, well, if there's equal laws in the books, then that's where the, this fight ends. It's not. Um, and that's what's really has motivated me to keep trying to chip away at this um, every day. Well, I'd, I'd say you took that lesson uh, pretty far and continued to uh, to learn from it. Representative Brooks, you also had you know a lot of uh, a lot of law in your background, including uh, your tenure as uh, U.S. Attorney uh, in Indiana and uh, private practice. What experiences in your background? Uh, you know, do you have in mind or, or, you know, brought you to where, where we are today in terms of your leadership on, on the civil legal aid issue? Ron, particularly for the uh, law students who are, who might be listening, um, it was actually an internship. I worked in the Marion County Public Defender's Office, that's in Indianapolis, um, as an internship. And um, I really didn't have experience with the criminal justice system prior to that uh, experience interning um, in the public defender's office. And I saw uh, the passion that those public defenders, that passionate advocacy that they provided their clients. I, uh, this is when we were sent over as young interns to interview clients in the jail. Um, and I was, uh, you know, visiting people all of the time learning about um, you know, what brought them into the criminal justice system, uh, learning the facts of their case. Um, but then when I graduated uh, from law school, I actually went into criminal defense as a practice area. And that is what I did for actually 13 years. Had a small practice uh, with a fabulous practitioner, Rick Kamen in Indianapolis and um, we were, while we were in private practice, uh, we also took on some pro bono cases, of course, 
and I also became, um, I was on the uh, federal public defenders panel when there were conflicts. And so I represented a lot of folks um, more, more uh, in my law practice, you know, in the private side, clients who paid, but I saw, you know, the tremendous need um, that we have, uh, you know, that, that lawyers made in cases. And so while I didn't practice as much on the civil side, I, the, I had so many interactions with judges and saw, um, uh, once I went to the mayor's office, I was deputy mayor in Indianapolis and worked a lot with um, our judges in the courts because we had a jail overcrowding issue. And so I worked a lot with the judges and I saw how important it was and how much better the system ran and how much more judges wanted litigants to have lawyers uh, to protect their rights, but also to help the system. Um, and just to make sure that it was fair for you know, the people who were coming before them. Um, and so that's really what, what caused me to be really very interested in this. And once I came to Congress, um, actually, it was a federal judge in the Southern District of Indiana, Sarah Evans Barker, a mentor. She spoke at my law school commencement way back in 1985. I hate to even wonder how old Joe was in 1985. Anyway, um, but she was my law school commencement speaker, and we, we developed a really lovely relationship uh, throughout the years. And when I came to Congress, she actually challenged me early on uh, to make sure I took care of the poor um, and to make sure I, uh, to encourage me to find ways to help those less fortunate. And so, um, you know, that was one of the, you know, this was one way that I, that I feel like I've contributed to that during my time in Congress. Uh, you know, it's amazing. And uh, both of your uh, experiences bear this out. It's amazing how um, experiences we have as kids or as young adults or going into law school uh, can affect us and, and, and instill us with values or reinforce values maybe we already brought with us uh, and that those continue to inform us and resonate through our lives. Both of you alluded to the importance of lawyers in our legal system. We have a system that was basically designed by lawyers and uh, really designed on the assumption that uh, uh, people would have lawyers. And uh, we often talk about the justice gap, the, the gap between legal needs of low-income Americans and the resources available to meet those needs. Uh, we did a justice gap study in 2017 with the National Opinion Resource Center, which found that 86% of the civil legal problems faced by low-income Americans were addressed with either no legal assistance or inadequate uh, assistance. Um, so let me uh, let me ask you a compound question, which you know, as a lawyer, you shouldn't do. But uh, one, how does the justice gap fit into your thinking as you uh, have your legislative hats on and uh, how do you see the pandemic we're currently living through as affecting the justice gap and the need for civil legal aid? The justice gap is real as your you know, survey and, and, and polls have shown. And um, I think you see it anytime you appear in the courts. And while you know, Joe and I maybe haven't had the opportunity to be in a lot of courts in the last several years, I, on occasion, I, I have really welcomed the opportunity, whether it was to during the um, height of the opioid crisis and when we were focusing on legislation, you know, I visited what's called a new family recovery court in Grant County, Indiana. Um, and, uh, and many of those folks that come through those courts, whether um, it is for family matters or juvenile matters, often don't have lawyers. And yet the impact on what can happen to them in their lives and the tremendous power that judges have um, to, to make decisions about their families, um, that is when we absolutely realize that these people are trying to decide how they're going to feed their families, how they're going to pay their rent, 
uh, or if they happen to have a mortgage payment, how they're gonna make their car payment and or you know, make sure they've got enough money for public transportation to get to their job if they have one. These are all things that I think COVID more than uh, any time, certainly in my lifetime, is uh, wreaking havoc on just the everyday lives and concerns of Americans. All of those things are at risk. When we had the lowest unemployment before this hit, and now we went to some of the highest unemployment we've ever had, um, you know, I'm pleased that, that there are moratoriums on evictions you know, for a period of time, but you know, when might that end? We know that more children are hungry now uh, than ever before, and that's why I'm really pleased uh, that in the CR that we just got done this week, that we boosted you know, the, um, the food for the nutrition programs for kids in schools. Um, the pandemic is, uh, is, is really uh, so very frightening for all those basic human needs. And then if they have the legal issues that have to be pulled into a system that they have no background on and that can be so unfair if they don't get that legal advice, it's, it's, I think the gap is going to widen unless the legal community steps up, unless we in Congress support um, LSCs around the, the country. I'm really proud of John Larimore and the Indiana Legal Services Corporation and all those lawyers and paralegals and volunteers. We have to support them because they're gonna hold the fabric of our country together in many ways so that we don't have just complete destitution you know, so many destitute people in this country. So, uh, okay, I've rambled long enough, um, but the justice gap is real and the pandemic, uh, unfortunately, I think is gonna make it even greater. I, I, I loved your rambling, <laughs> but uh, uh, Representative Kennedy, what, what are your thoughts on the justice gap and uh, the effect of the pandemic on, on the justice gap? So the justice gap gets at the heart of, I think, why, um, Susan and I represent Brooks and I have gone about this, forming this caucus and this work, right? And so it's, it's two pieces, right? It's one, the fact that, at least from my perspective, that people are forced to navigate through a court system alone. And uh, when you do, you get extremely, um, you get outcomes that are uh, extremely disparate. And so, we have to make sure one that, that knowing that that's the outcome you have to make sure that twofold one that there's actually enough lawyers there to make sure that somebody can navigate through that system with um an advocate by their side and that that advocate is obviously um appropriately talented and trained and, and adequate and what we know because of the justice gap is that the first piece is the the biggest problem there is that there's just there's not far too many people millions of people are forced to navigate through the system uh, alone without that recourse. And, you know, I, I think that many, uh, the area where this is getting the most amount of attention is kind of, kind of the, some of the work that I did in housing, particularly because of the compounding of this, this pandemic when, as, as uh, Representative Brooks indicated, these eviction moratoriums are in place and thank God that they are and they're uh, extraordinary stop gaps, but they're stop gaps. But at some point, um, people are going to have to, um, homeowners or uh, commercial landlords, whatever else, uh, both uh, residential and commercial, are going to need to get those rent checks paid. And people are going to need to pay rent again. And so we need to make sure we're not just delaying the inevitable, but we're getting out in front of it. And um, so housing is a big piece of this. but. Uh, this is, I saw this every day in court when I was a domestic violence prosecutor. And I'd arraign somebody on charges of uh, abuse of, uh, of their partner. And then I would sit down and um, the victim would move for a restraining order. And often that victim, um, because there's, there can be cross-examination there, is left to navigate that proceeding alone, getting cross-examined by a private attorney, uh, by the, the defendant, at least at this point. And that testimony is locked in for the course of a criminal trial. And you sit there and look at this and go on day, day one, somebody could have been abused hours earlier. And on day one, without any sort of um, understanding or knowledge or assistance, 
is having testimony locked in that's going to impact the outcome of a criminal proceeding, and they're forced to navigate it alone, terrified and scared. And so whether it's child custody and the imbalance that we see sometimes through divorce, whether it's the, whether it comes to healthcare discrimination or, or housing, so the basic impacts uh, or the impacts of, of basic human need, this is what has been, we know that there's already a massive disparity, uh, particularly for the poor, because they can't have access, they, they don't oftentimes have money to access a lawyer, there's not enough funds uh, pushed down from LSC and, and, um, and other legal aid organizations and philanthropy and law firms to actually meet that need. But we also know that all of this is going to compound because of COVID, uh, because um, people have been financially devastated, and so their own philanthropic giving is not going to be as robust as it would have been. Uh, state and federal bu budgets are tight, so they're not going to be uh, as generous as we would have otherwise been. The dislocation that people are going to feel is enormous. The anxiety that leads to mental health uh, challenges, that it's going to lead to employment challenges or school challenges or otherwise, all of this is going to cascade. And so we have what was already a crisis to begin with, compounded by a never um, a type of public health and economic crisis that we haven't seen in at least 100 years and, and arguably never. Um, and one of the ways we can try to institute and protect some someone's of fairness through this is to make sure that in our, our justice system, which is supposed to ensure that it's your, supposed to be your backstop, the place where when all else fails, you get a fair shake. We can at least make sure that that has the tools needed and necessary and the resources needed and necessary to try to catch our citizens so that they do get a fair shake in what we know is going to be a crisis coming forward. And as of now, they don't. Um, we, were, we have pushed for additional funding through things like the HEROES Act to try to make sure that there, um, and CARES Act to make sure that there is more funding for, for legal services because we know this crisis is coming, but there's an awful lot more work that needs to be done without question. So you, you, you both have really eloquently talked about the justice gap and, and you know, really in, in, in personal terms, both in, in your careers and on the lives of, of people you know, living uh, in America today and living in poverty today. What do you see uh, as the role of Congress and federal funding in addressing those needs that you've, you've identified uh, Representative Kennedy, why don't we start with you? So, uh, look, I think the federal government has um, a really important role to play here. Um, and I say that because, um, look, well, a lot of these issues that I just mentioned uh, end up taking place at a state level, right? It's, um, it's state law, the impact of eviction is not normally implicate federal law. Um, but it's the federal government that has the ability to fund resources down to the states to be able to make this work, particularly given that states are going to be facing unprecedented budget challenges uh, moving forward. And so, look, LS, uh, legal services funding, I think, again, is a necessary for the federal government, is a necessary but insufficient um, uh, answer to this question. Um, it's where we're going to have to also get creative in the use of technology, um, the use of, um, you know, everything from, uh, from telecommuting or, um, uh, again, uh, we're pretend, potentially even uh, you know remote advocacy um, to kiosks in multiple languages, so that somebody could fill out an answer and counter claims sitting right there in a way that people can understand. Um, to the use of people that have retired, uh, retired lawyers to come in and, and try to stop this, uh, meet this need. Um, but without question, you're not going to be able to get around the fact that there's more resources that are needed and necessary. And the entity, the only entity particularly now that has the ability to, to do this is the federal government. And the last thing here, studies after multiple studies at this point, I should say, um, have shown that the investment, upfront investment in legal services actually saves society an awful lot of money down the road, right? And um, there's been um, some pioneering work, particularly on the social costs of eviction. And for folks that are evicted for non-payment of rent, what the actual amount of rent that they are behind that leads to that eviction, which is literally pennies on the dollar when you think of the compound and impact of um, sheriffs or whoever the local authorities are that have to come and move out um, the, the uh, occupants um, 
materials, the stuff that gets dumped on the street, the social cost of relocation, of taking kids out of school, of finding another place to live, all of that. Oftentimes for literally being behind on rent of a hundred bucks, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. But think of the cost that is associated with that. And if we can actually provide legal counsel there to, to minimize that disruption and to put people on payment plans and do all the rest of it, how much we actually would save in terms of a, a cost to all of us. So not only is this the right thing to do, I think, judicially, um, but it's the right thing to do economically. Representative Brooks, what, what are your thoughts on, on the role of Congress and, and federal funding? I do think Congress has a key, if not the lead role to play. And I agree with, with so much of what Joe has to say. We um, in Congress really have to set the tone for the nation. And um, while I hear you know, colleagues talking a lot about actually things like evictions, um, things like hunger, um, challenges with education right now, uh, rise in domestic violence, concerns about all of that, they often don't put it in the context of the courts. They put it in the context of the problem and what you know, we maybe ought to be doing to focus on whether it's mental health or jobs in the economy. But often our colleagues, and that's the importance I think of the caucus, is trying to remind them that these problems ultimately end up in the courts. Uh, particularly around evictions or around addictions and people getting arrested or around issues around homelessness, they often do end up in the courts. Um, and so uh, I, I do think the funding is critically important uh, that uh, Congress do, uh, that we do set aside funding, particularly during this pandemic and how we're going to deal with this. Uh, that goes to the states for the states to make the appropriate allocations. Um, but yet I think everyone has to also think about that it can't just be government. Um, we are gonna have to ask people, and I love Joe's idea of whether it's retired attorneys and judges and just other people stepping up now um, and doing their part. Uh, so many judges and, and lawyers whether they're active and practicing or retired, um, have the skills that are needed to help their fellow citizens. And maybe they can't write a check right now because uh, their budgets have gotten tighter, but maybe they can provide the time. And I do think, I actually talked to a couple judges this week on different subjects, issues, and they are working remotely. So technology um, is absolutely being utilized in most of our court systems right now. And so, you know, why not take, uh, you know, and, and help, you know, call your LSC uh, office and uh, sign up to volunteer um, and, you know, actually think about doing your part in a different way because that advice you provide over the phone. I mean, all of us who are lawyers have a family member uh, or two or three or more who call us for advice. You know, uh, whether they, and maybe family members who have financial struggles of their own, um, and maybe they are spread across the country, but they might call us for advice whether we know that subject area of the law or not. We all know more than they typically know and can be helpful. And so I think lawyers uh, often don't appreciate how much they know um, and how easily they can learn another area of the law. And so I would encourage, you know, your listeners to think about, um, you know, challenging fellow bar members, uh, retired and, at, you know, and active bar members to, to think about how they can give right now for, for a while. Um, I, and I know many of them are business owners themselves. They're trying to pay their employees and keep their own businesses afloat. Um, but yet, this is a great way to just help their neighbor who's far less fortunate. In terms of the role of Congress and, and federal funding, the, the pandemic has just underscored that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, state and local governments, those that have traditionally uh, and in the past funded legal aid, obviously their budgets are even more constrained than the federal budget and uh, uh, to the extent uh, that that's happening, our, our programs are seeing uh, a, a, a large 
diminishment in uh, state and local assistance. Uh, I'd like you to, as we're talking about uh, Congress's role, you know, give our, our viewers and listeners uh, some uh, a, a, a view into the, the practical aspects of that, particularly in the House. You're the uh, co-chairs and founders of the Access to Civil Legal uh, Services Caucus. What's What's the role of the caucus in, in addressing the issues we've been talking about and what do you see as the role of the caucus going forward? Uh, Representative Brooks? Well, you know, uh, caucuses do play an important role in educating fellow members um, and their staffs. Um, and so often uh, our caucus uh, will have briefings on different issues. Um, and try to, again, educate our fellow members so that they can understand the issue. Um, while, uh, there, while there are a lot of lawyers in Congress, that certainly, um, there are a lot of members of Congress who are not lawyers and who really don't have uh, much exposure to the legal system and, and or understand what the needs are. So um, I know that we did tremendous work um, around uh, the opioid crisis, which was a very bipartisan, since Joe and I have been in Congress, it's been a huge crisis in the country. And it's been a real, that's, uh, we've worked on a lot of um, important things in the committee. He and I work on an energy and commerce, but we've done a lot in a bipartisan way around opioids. Well, the whole addiction issue, mental health issues, all come together as well um, when it comes to civil legal aid issues. And um, so just educating our colleagues and then asking them for support, particularly when it comes to appropriations. Um, leading letters of, of support um, and or, um, you know, educating our letters through, or our colleagues through what are called dear colleague letters, if there's some, you know, report or something we wanna share with them. So that's how the, uh, that's how the caucus works. Um, I think uh, Joe and I have a little bit of time left to make sure that uh, we're passing the baton to good folks. Um, you know, I'm just starting to, you know, uh, really think about who I should pass the baton to and ask them to step up. Um, and people may come in like we came in and did this after we were freshmen. And that's what we're called as new members. And it could be there are new members that also come in and that hopefully have a passion for this. And so I think it'll be, you know, important for Joe and I to be, you know, looking out for and trying to cultivate those next leaders as we as we kind of retire together. Well, you you leave a tremendous legacy, and anybody who follows has uh, mighty big shoes to to fill, and we're very grateful for what you've done, Representative Kennedy. Um, LSC is in the equal justice business. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the relationship between civil legal aid and, and the issues of racial justice and injustice that are obviously on many people's minds these days. Look, uh, I think, um, and I'd welcome Susan's thoughts to this too, because I think she has a, an important perspective here given her, her, her career um, at the federal level and um, uh, as a prosecutor, a uh, federal prosecutor as well. But um, look, I, I think I think most many don't quite understand well, well, in this moment of kind of racial reckoning we're seeing around the country, and particularly uh, again this week, um, so much of that discussion and, and so much of that focus on the one hand, rightfully, is on the criminal justice system uh, and wrestling with the disparities and disparate treatment that we've seen there now for, for literally centuries. What I think people don't understand is how the lack of justice in a civil justice system compounds that and how they work to, um, to, to mutually reinforce. And just the uh, generic example here, obviously, but um, we know that um, uh, there's disparate treatment for the arrests of marijuana and marijuana possession in the states where marijuana um, had been illegal and, and now still is illegal uh, for minorities. Um, and a disparate treatment between whites and blacks. Um, but what folks won't necessarily think through is, well, if there's a drug conviction there, what that means for your, uh, if you happen to have, uh, or be a recipient of affordable housing, and um, what that conviction might then mean for your ability to stay in your, uh, in your home. And so um, if you happen to be, you know, if you're a, um, uh, 
a kid and living with your parents and it's your mom that is the recipient of that voucher, but now all of a sudden your, your child has a uh, conviction. Now is that, is that voucher in jeopardy? And is the family going to be displaced? Um, and where are you going to go? And if you are displaced, what then comes next? And the ways in which these issues can compound. Um, and, you know, we look at particularly issues around a reentry system. Um, and where for states that operate under a federal minimum wage for tipped workers, which is still um, a little over $2 an hour. Um, for people that are trying to re-enter society after uh, serving a sentence, if um, many have to get an entry level position, if that's where that position, if that's where you have to go, but then you're subject to discrimination. And, and often we know that food service industry is one of the uh, areas ripe for, for sexual harassment. Um, if um, that is being held over your head in order to get access to a tip, um, which is what you need in order to pay rent, or pay your family or, or, or meet your basic needs, how that compounds, right? And the, the kind of myriad ways in which the system, rather than actually trying to help people turn the page and set a foundation up for uh, a new beginning, actually makes it impossible for people to be able to succeed. And access to a lawyer there isn't gonna solve all of those problems, but it sure can help. And I think we have to, it's been one of my uh, focuses here, but it's trying to make sure we tell that side of this story as well. Because um, I think it's critically important to actually redesigning the impact, understanding how these these policies intersect, um, the intersectionality of them, and, and um, trying to make sure we craft them and adjust them the right way to make sure that um, we reset that framework a bit. Representative Brooks, as as uh, Representative Kennedy mentioned, you've had a you know a long background in our criminal justice system and other aspects of our justice system, as well as your uh, impressive work in Congress on these issues. What are your thoughts on uh, the uh, intersection of civil legal aid and, and racial justice? Well, and I, um, I, I agree with so much of what Joe has had to say. Um, I do think that the country um, the fact that we are focusing now more than any time in many ways in, in my adult life on issues around race and racial injustice, I think is a positive thing. I was disappointed, quite frankly, in now, Joe and I have probably been disappointed many times in the House of Representatives, but I was disappointed most recently this past summer um, when Congress, when we in the House could not come together or the Senate, quite frankly, and come up with some real uh, reforms involving, you know, our, our police training and, and police departments in the country. I think it was a big miss. I think it was an opportunity for us to have uh, brought the country together during an important uh, time um, and it, it's incredibly unfortunate. I just finished a committee hearing on what's called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. And uh, we're, we've rolled out our recommendations just to prove them today and a completely bipartisan committee. And it showed, uh, and we've been doing work on really important issues for a long time. And, but it's the manner in which we did our work. And I think Congress um, has a ways to go. And if they follow these recommendations we just passed, and sadly, Joe and I won't you know, be here to um, help them shepherd them, but um, I think we can find a lot more common ground that we f than we find. And, uh, and I think the country really needs that around the issues of race right now. Um, and race, uh, absolutely, for all of the different examples that, um, that Joe did uh, talk about, I think does play a role um, in the issues of civil legal aid and, um, and in our courts. And, and I think, and the courts, I believe for the most part recognize that. I, I know that uh, Justice Rush in leading, um, you know, Indiana Supreme Court, uh, that, that we are very focused on that. Our governor, Governor Holcomb is very focused on it. And, um, but, the, but we have to get to a place, and this is where Congress should be leading. We have to get to a place where we can have civil dialogues and lawyers 
yes, we can be really, you know, um, passionate advocates in courtrooms or across, uh, you know, a, a, med a mediation table um, in many ways, but you've got to find ways, and in many ways, civility in the bar needs to be, I think, leading the way and can be leading the way for the country and civility in Congress. We need to up our game in Congress so that members aren't tweeting at each other. So, because all of these things, um, I think, impede our progress on these difficult issues like racial justice and issues around our court system. Well, I, you, you talk about civility in Congress. I, I, I think uh, uh, the two of you epitomize that, and uh, your uh, discussion today epitomizes that, and I'm so grateful for everything you've done, uh, which leads me to my last question, uh, and, and I, I hope uh, continued leadership in, in civil legal aid is part of your answer, but What's next for, for each of you? Uh, Representative Brooks, what, what's, what, what are you thinking yeah, about? Start with her first. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I've had a little more time to be thinking about it. I announced my retirement last June. However, I have to admit, I really wasn't gonna focus on what's next until this calendar year. And then when COVID hit, I've been amazed how incredibly busy um, I have been as the representative of the fifth and how busy we all are, all of our congressional offices helping constituents. And so I'm still working on uh, what I'm going to be doing next. Um, I am gonna be focused a lot more on uh, my role as a daughter, wife, and mother. That uh, needs to take a bit higher priority than it's, it's taken for quite a while. They've been supported me in my career. Uh, and now it's time for me to, to do more uh, in that arena. And, uh, and I hope to have a lot more flexibility, but I hope to still make contributions um, in many ways. And in some ways, uh, be one of those, uh, believe it or not, cheerleaders and or someone who pushes Congress uh, from the outside uh, to step up and do better for the American people. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I'll probably be spending a lot more time in Indiana um, and, uh, you know, and, and hopefully find a way to contribute and still give back, whether it's to law students or, um, you know, to the legal profession and legal community. Um, I very much would like to do that, um, what, you know, through an academic institution in some way. But, uh, you know, I'm going to, that's what this last quarter is for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. And I made sure that I had Joe's cell number so that we can keep in touch. And, uh, and we have, we have, I just had a lot of, a, I had a lot of numbers for him. I got confused recently. I stopped and like, which number is the best number to reach him? He's been a little bit busier than I've been. Um, but I've been really, really proud to have been, uh, have watched and kind of, because we were on energy and commerce together, because we've worked on some pretty important things together. Uh, it'll be one of the highlights for me leaving and a very dear friendship, and I'm gonna miss him. Uh, Susan, thank you. Um, and, and that feeling is certainly mutual. Um, look, uh, I, I don't know. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, I look forward to, to spend, taking some time to figure that out. Um, I have two very little kids and um, look forward to spending some more time with them and, and, uh, and my wife and uh, Lauren and, and some time in Massachusetts as well. Um, a lot of the issues that I care about are still, um, there's a lot of work to be done. So trying to figure out exactly how um, I'm able to uh, take the best parts of this job and, and yeah, the issues that I care about and, and carry them forward and leave some of the parts that, um, you know, I think uh, everyone can imagine there's uh, serving in Congress is an incredible honor. It comes with challenges and a lot of stress on a family and, and travel and um, a very hectic schedule and, and um, a very demanding job. I think if you're doing it right, and I think Susan did it right, and, and I threw everything I had at it. So um, looking forward to, um, to uh, taking a little bit of time to try to figure out what's next. But again, a lot of work to do and a lot of work to be done. And, and uh, I look forward to finding a way to make that contribution. Well, let me end our conversation where we began. Uh, thank you. Thanks to both of you. To state the obvious, bipartisanship has not been much in evidence recently or in recent years. But your leadership has succeeded 
in spotlighting legal aid and equal justice as core American values, as core constituent services, and in doing so in exercising that leadership, you've garnered the support for LSC and equal justice from Republicans and Democrats, members of the Freedom Caucus and members of the Progressive Caucus. Your leadership of the Access to Civil Legal Services Caucus has materially advanced justice in America. To be sure, we have a long way to go, but you have pointed us in the right direction and started a bipartisan march in that direction. Thank you so much. Stay well and good night. Podcast guest speakers' views, thoughts, and opinions are solely their own and do not necessarily represent the Legal Services Corporation's views, thoughts, or opinions. The information and guidance discussed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice. You should not make decisions based on the podcast content without seeking legal or other professional advice.